Hey, what's good self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital and today we're going to do a quick midweek update focusing on Cureleaf's Q4 earnings. Now before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learn something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And then of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss any new videos. But I would recommend going back and watching episodes three and four of the series I made called Reality Check Cannabis in 2020. That will introduce you to the US multi-state operators and the Canadian licensed producers. And these are the companies that can legally operate, cultivate, distribute, and sell cannabis in you know the US and Canada. So that will give you a good foothold on who to look for. And then you can watch episodes of this week in cannabis leading up until now. But without further ado, Cureleaf gave us a beautiful mess up here. So we're just going to jump right into the numbers. Makes it a lot easier. For total revenue in Q4 of 230 million, up from 182 million, a 26% increase quarter over quarter. Um, and from Q4 in 2019 to Q4 2020, uh, they went from 75.4 million up to 230 million, 200% or 205% increase. That's pretty phenomenal. And then I guess when you do their full fiscal year 2019 compared to their full fiscal year 2020 after subtracting all of these things. Um, it was a total of 626 million in 2020, up from 220 million in 2019, which is a 184% increase. Now they did mention up here pro forma revenue, but this includes revenue of companies that they bought and just brought in that they could account for as their revenue now. But main thing, if we go by total revenue, uh, this is from their operations. So I think that's just a safer number. But main thing, if, if we look gross profit, you know, alongside the revenue growing, we want to see gross profit growing. And gross profit grew by 285% from 2019 to 2020. This is huge. That's a big number to see as well, because as long as revenues are growing, um, you know, companies do have to spend money to make money. So at the same time, you want to see their gross profits increasing to 275 million. That's a lot of money. Very big. Now, as you can see, they did uh, suffer a net income loss of $35 million, which was a significant increase from what they spent in 2020, uh, just 9 million. But if we look again, full year 2019 versus full year 2020, uh, you know, th they did spend a lot of money because Cureleaf's goal is to be the biggest with the most dispensaries and the largest footprint, and that requires expansion, which requires spending. But if we can see, they did even spend less, uh, 6 million less in 2020 than in 2019, which is quite good. Um, and again, they're very close to eventually being profitable. So as long as they can continue this growth, uh, they should not, you know, they should be on that path. Now, I just want to cover the full year highlights. Um, their total revenue of 626, again, up 184 year over year. Uh, record adjusted positive EBITDA of 114 million. So this is a profitability indicator. Uh, you want to see this number being positive, which grew more than four times. And the main thing is, again, why they're spending to, to increase or to grow is they did successfully complete eight acquisitions, including the brands Select, Grassroots, Cureleaf, New Jersey, Arrow, Moe, Remedy, Blue Kudo, and ATG. And so obviously if you're buying more brands, then you're going to pick up on their business, but, and that's where that pro forma revenue is coming from. Um, but what this has also allowed them to do is they're growing the retail operations from 51 to 96, um, physical dispensaries, and they've got cultivation sites from 14 up to 23, and then processing sites from 15 to 30. And the main thing is a multi-state operator with the current overhead federal laws, you have to have, um, cultivation sites and processing sites in the same states that you sell to. So, you know, in order to be in this many states, they have to have a cultivation site and a processing site in all of these states as well. Um, but they've expanded over this past year from 14 to 23 states, which does make Cureleaf the biggest of the big. Um, so again, yeah, they're, they're aiming big. Think of them as Canopy in 2018, uh, but they're certainly making a lot more profit and, and blowing less money compared to Canopy. Um, but, and then just to point out what they did in this past year, they did complete the acquisition, or in this last quarter, sorry, completing the acquisition of ATG. Um, but th this is the big news. They have announced that they're going to enter the European cannabis market with the acquisition of Emac Life Sciences Limited, Europe's largest, ver largest vertically integrated independent cannabis company, making Cureleaf the indisputed global leader, uh, market leader based on revenue. Now, this is is basically what I see. This is uh, this is them entering competition with the free and Tilray, which is great to see, um, which means they're paying attention to what the Canadian LPs are doing and what they see long-term internationally for medicinal. Um, but they raised net proceeds of $240 million. So, you know, they were raising a lot of money in the past weeks. We can see why, because they wanted to use some of it to buy uh, and then also some cash to, to make this purchase. And since since the end of 2020 into 2021, they have opened five new dispensaries, putting them up to 101 uh, retail locations in the U.S., which makes them the biggest. And again, they didn't give any guidance for 2021, but we expect to see positive benefits of the transformation or the transformative legalization of adult use cannabis in Arizona and New Jersey. And again, so that's think of states where there's 200 or 300,000 people with medical licenses. Overnight, once you open up that market, 
you know, six, five million, six million adults can now access. It's just, it's unbelievable the exp exponential growth we're going to see from that. Now, so I just want to run through a few things though to point out. So they have seven, 73.5 million cash on hand, 291.5 million of outstanding debt. But again, with, with the rate that they're growing their profits and their revenue, they should be able to tackle that without any problems. One thing I did want to point out though, um, which is amazing, firstly, is that their revenue uh, in retail and in wholesale uh, is just simply increasing quarter over quarter, growing at a phenomenal rate, which is good. But this is one thing I wanted to point out because this is something I only learned from experience watching, you know, uh, Canopy and Aurora and Afria back in the day is that they do, because they've bought a lot of companies, they've got quite a, a lot of intangible assets and goodwill and, you know, over a billion. And when you break that down, what is intangible assets? What are goodwill? They're assets that are not physical. They're not real. You know, they're perceived to have value like trademarks, like brand names. Um, you know, so when you're buying a brand, um, you know, you could spend four million to buy the or to buy a company, but then you pay five million for you know a million in goodwill kind of thing. Goodwill is the reputation of these these non-physical things that you're 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 taking on. So, anyways, if we look at total assets, two point three billion, but then total liabilities of one point one billion, this looks very healthy. But if we were to subtract this these intangible assets and their goodwill, that brings them down to one point three billion. So, not as healthy. But I do want to point out is that these acquisitions in U.S. For U.S. companies, where there is a large population, it's possible that Cureleaf will see a reduction in in this in the, this cost of assets because, you know, when when you pay for goodwill and intangible assets, you're paying in hopes that whatever you're buying is going to return make a return on your investment so that you can eventually add to start, you know, you can add to this and and reduce it as opposed to what we saw with Canopy and Aurora writing off hundreds of millions or billions of dollars which, you know, again, is just, it's a terrible sign for a company in that said quarter, but again, long-term, uh, this is why we have to look big with the cannabis industry. So I just wanted to point that out though, that that does add a, about a billion dollars right here that is a bit iffy on the asset balance sheet, which makes it less comfortable. But again, long-term, I think the growth outweighs that. Uh, and I just wanted to point that out because that's something that now that I, I can pick up on that I have this experience. So nonetheless, though, phenomenal numbers from Cureleaf. And so they enter this European cannabis market with $285 million deal. Um, they'll pay cash and stock for EMAC. And main thing, all, all this information will be down there below. But raising competition, all you can see is that U.S. companies have been focused on North America, but may eventually want to compete with their Canadian peers. And because Tilray is doing this, um, you know, yeah, this makes me think that's why Cureleaf is, is, is keen to jump in on it too. Now, I went through the site seems as if Emac uh, owns, it's like a holding company that owns other companies. So you'd have to go through and find out what revenue they are bringing in. But, uh, you know, as of right now, this does remind me of Shades of Early Canada. I mean, uh, definitely worth looking into what Emac Life Sciences does if you own Cureleaf. Um, but uh, nonetheless, great, uh, great, great show and results out of Cureleaf. Now, Acreage Holdings and other MSO reports um, strong fourth quarter revenue of 35.1 million and a full year revenue of 114 million, increased 50% to 55%. Mind you, they still had net loss uh, of 36.9 million, while adjusted net loss attributable to 9.2. But so think about that. I mean, in this past quarter, Acreage lost just as much money as Cureleaf. Mind you, Cureleaf is so much bigger. So it seems Cureleaf is getting really good at cutting cost and maximizing their operations. Now, for whatever reason, they did not give as clear of a breakdown as other companies. Like, where's the revenue? Where's the cost? I, I, it's very strange seeing this, but I just wanted to point out, going down here, it seems like most of their revenue is coming from the Midwest. And what do they classify as the Midwest? Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, and Oklahoma. So again, I think a big factor of these sales for acreage has been Illinois, um, but you, we can see that most sales are coming from the Midwest, then in New England, uh, we do have sales, but these are Maine and New Hampshire, so much smaller markets, um, and and the West. So it just gives a breakdown of where their profits are coming from. But uh, you know, this is just a different tier company, much smaller, but still growing. And then if you just flip this to show a Canadian company that you know is a smaller one, it's just the numbers do not compare. Green Organic Dutchman, nice to see them reporting some strong growth, 10 million, uh, which means that they are getting more market share in Canada, which is great. But essentially, you know, full year revenue of just 24.5 million. Although it's still 120% increase year over year, we just don't see the growth in Canada that we see in the U.S., right? So um, all, pot star, all pot stocks are not created equally, that is for sure. U.S. cannabis companies are growing faster than Canadian rivals, but the catch is that their shares are harder to trade. So basically, waking up to seeing the Wall Street Journal you know, report on everything that I've been talking about was very, was a very nice feeling. And so they're just talking about how um, Cureleaf kicks off the fourth quarter yesterday, and then large Canadian companies have released their numbers in the winter months, uh, and their sales grew by 52% on average. And we saw that, you know, their stock prices have climbed because of that. 
Now, while that's impressive, uh, it's pale in comparison to what the American companies are achieving. As we've got Cureleaf, Green Thumb Industries, Cresco Labs, Truly have reported average sales growth of 180%. So way more growth, yet their stock price is reflecting way lower valuations. So just to give an example here, Canadian cannabis stocks are trading at 20 times multiples. So just to keep this easy as an example, if you make 100 million in revenue or sales and your market cap is 2 billion, then that's kind of a fair value based on what we give other companies and growth industries, a 20x uh, price to sales multiple. So again, yeah, uh, just think of your sales and then 20 times that, that would be a fair um, you know, market cap for your company. Whereas US pot companies are trading at seven times. So just to give an example of what, what I think Cresco Labs is gonna do in 2020, they're gonna do 500 million in revenue. Mind you, right now they're sitting at like a $3.5 billion market cap. So right there, that's they're trading at seven times. So if we were to value Cresco like the Canadian pot stocks, um, they could potentially increase three times to get up to 20x, um, and that would put Cresco almost at a seven billion dollar market cap, bringing in 500 million in revenue. I hope that makes sense. Please let me know in the in the comments if you have any questions. I can try to clarify it. Um, but so ultimately, what this is saying is that U.S. companies could potentially rise 2.5x to 3x uh, to to be essentially fair valued with the Canadian companies. That is what this article is saying. So the New York Times right here is saying there's potentially 2.5x to 3x upside for buying U.S. stocks versus Canadian stocks. The much greater margin of safety, so that's huge. Um, and again, the explanation mostly lies in where the stocks are listed. And as I've said this many times, Canadians have access to companies on the major exchanges, so they get more exposure. Uh, these Can U.S. multi-state operators don't. So just great that this news is getting out there. More people are, are being aware of this. Um, so let's get into some of the states. Recreational cannabis sales in Michigan reached $341 million in 2020. So those are some big numbers. Now, we did see last, uh, I think last week in cannabis where I covered that they did just under a billion. So this would be their combined sales of medical and legal cannabis. Uh, but again, just great growth from Michigan, and we hope that continues. Now, Minnesota, apparently, uh, they've just legalized uh, cannabis flower for medical use. Now, this is new. I didn't know about this, but right now in Minnesota, medical cannabis or cannabis uh, is only allowed in pill or liquid form. So you can only buy like vape concentrate um, or pill form, I guess. Interesting. So this is progress though. And, and for, for Vireo, a company that I, I'm happy to own, a smaller cap company with a, a large footprint in Minnesota, this makes me uh, quite optimistic for them. So that's great news. Hawaii did approve another cannabis bill and a separate decriminalization expansion proposal. Now, all of this to say that, you know, nothing, <laughs> it just goes to show how long these things actually take. Um, both pieces of legislation now head to the House for consideration. Should they get final approval? However, it still remains to be seen how the governor is going to approach them. So, you know, look, lots of progress can be made, but just to show again, there's so many moving parts. So, you know, just got to be patient and hope that they work out now. And lastly, New York, I just want to point out that we still have April 1st as the deadline for Cuomo and how New York's, uh, or how the legalization efforts could be impacted by Cuomo scandals. It seems like Cuomo just keeps being the bug of news in different different areas, uh, but it seems as if lawmakers in New York, we cannot stop. As a matter of fact, we need to start pounding a little harder, not just on the governor, but put people, but on people across the state. The leaders are also polling that legalization shows if New York had a referendum process to place the issue on the ballot, so like had they been able to vote on that in November, it would have passed without having to have any of these conversations. So main thing is that, I uh, forget it, if we don't get it done by April 1st, we won't get it done. He said that multiple times, but you know, again, because New Jersey's done it and they need this more than ever, we have more hope that it's going to pass. It's just very annoying when he just keeps talking when like Cuomo just just do the thing that people want, right? I don't know why they need to talk so much instead of act. When you do, you get more things done than when you talk about doing things. Now, just want to point out uh, Trueleaf and Morehouse School of Medicine partner for cannabis research and education. This is amazing because even still with the... Um, with cannabis being federally legal as a Schedule One substance, you still can't research it. But... Trueleaf Georgia, Inc., which I did not know that Trueleaf had a subsidiary or had started business in Georgia, um, and Morehouse School of Medicine, I, I guess, I'm guessing a school based in Georgia, announced partnership to conduct, can, conduct cannabis research and education. Now, the main thing I just want to point out is that as of right now, Georgia, I don't think has legal, um, or the, at least they're implementing uh, potential legal medical, but I don't believe that they're legal for adult use or anything like that. So, you know, what I would hope is that this research and this partnership between TrueLeave and, and a school, which is going to facilitate the research, can get us some positive results and hopefully see the uh, 
you know, see reform in Georgia sooner than later. Just wanted to point that out because these cannabis companies, you know, are partnering with schools and, um, you know, with communities and trying to raise the awareness on cannabis and normalize it sooner than later, which is, again, what we need out of good leaders. Now, let's go worldwide. Mexican committees approve revised cannabis legalization bill with the, with the floor vote expected Wednesday, later today. So I did want to get this out early to try and show you. Now, uh, the bill did pass, or so lawmakers and two committees... Uh, amended and approved the bill on Monday, uh, and it did vote. So what happens now? Uh, and again, this stuff takes so long. Uh, where was I going with this? So if deputies approve the legalization bill in amended form, it will head back to the Senate, where lawmakers then have to consider other chambers' changes. So you know what other chambers want made to it. But um, last thing to point out: now the legislator has until the end of April to legalize cannabis. So this deadline, which was April one, gets pushed to the end of April. But again, that's big. This is huge. So that means, you know, hopefully by the end of April, and we just have to hold them to this, I will keep an eye on that. Um, end of April, we will have Mexico being the third largest market. Now, Switzerland uh, allows doctors to directly prescribe medical cannabis. So again, this is just huge reform uh, and changes. Getting a prescription for medical cannabis just got a lot easier. Um, and Switzerland's upper chamber of government council of states approved a proposal that was that was passed by the Swiss National Council last December to allow doctors in the country to prescribe pot without federal law authorization, which was previously required. And this move comes from the December ruling from the UN and the World Health Organization. Follows the UN vote in December to deschedule cannabis and cannabis resin from Section IV of the 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. And this was set up, sadly, by American propagandists uh, in you know a long time ago to make cannabis illegal and make money off of it, sadly. So seeing this first step uh, you know, backtracked and, and then, you know, allowing Switzerland to allow medical. This is what we need for medical in Europe to start. Um, you know, it, it changes the narrative slowly but surely. So so this is awesome. Now, again, it doesn't allow adult use or anything like that, but it's, it's a step in Switzerland, which is great. Now, in Thailand, there's a green rush as the government pushes cannabis as a cash crop, which, I mean, obviously it is. Hemp plants are a variety of cannabis that have higher concentrations of CBD, um, non-psychoactive, but basically, ganja marijuana is the rising star to bring our good quality of lives and money back in our purses as good economy before we, uh, as before and even better. And yeah, no doubt, I think if every country adopted this and we're like, let's look at cannabis as something that we could potentially use to make our lives better and make um, business or, you know, things more sustainable. Uh, yes, that's exactly what this does. So um, Thailand, which has a tradition of using cannabis to relieve pain and fatigue, legalized cannabis for medical uh, use and research in 2017. So just good to see that uh, the narrative is changing in Thailand sooner than later. And an update from Morocco, uh, they're supposed to be reviewing the draft bill for the third time tomorrow, Thursday, the 11th of March, 2021. Um, but unfortunately, out of Morocco, it seems as if the, there was discussions in the last two councils, but nothing was passed. So um, I'm just going to leave it at that. But again, worldwide, more countries opening up. We will see what happens after their, their debate tomorrow. Hopefully, I'll have an update on the, on the weekend. But great to see, again, the world is opening up as the narrative slowly changes. Now, from Brady Cobb, who was the CEO of Bluma Wellness, and he's been in the cannabis industry for a while working with Liberty Health Sciences. And the only reason I'm familiar is because I've been paying attention since 2018, since 2019. But he provides safe update. And again, I, someone working in the industry on the ground floor... I do take what they say more seriously than, you know, some random person. So safe update, still a matter of when, not if, and still confident in March filing. By my count, we have the 60 votes needed in the Senate, which is awesome. That's what you need to pass it as a standalone bill. And the delay can be attributed to the COVID relief bill slowing down. Nothing more, nothing less. Buy the ticket, take the ride. So I love this reassurance. It's like a guy that like, hey man, we've come this far. Do not panic now. Like we're getting closer. And you know, this, this guy, yeah, I've had my neck out there since 2016 in D.C. relative to cannabis reform, par for the course. Ultimately, I don't get to vote in the House, just providing real-time insight. I'm long cannabis and has been for a while, and I know that Br that Brady is because I've followed him for a while. So that just gives me reassurance that, you know, the work is being done where it needs to be. And just to point out, I found this random document of, um, you know, a House joint resolution supporting the passage of Safe Banking Act of 2019, um, and this comes from Alaska. So the legislator in the state of Alaska, Alaska's like, can we please just pass this bill already? So, you know, again, we might not be seeing it on the mainstream and the TV, but know that it, the information's out there, and I'm trying to find you guys the most valuable pieces to connect your own, you know, reassuring uh, thesis and narrative going forward to ensure that you stay invested through these you know, slow times, the calm before the storm. And just to end this off, I think this is the perfect article, New Cannabis Ventures. Um, Alan Brockstein put this out, just a great article, and it says, states the facts, the truth. Cannabis markets across North America are booming. 
Growth was strong across the board, accelerated in California, 20, 28% still from a year ago. Uh, extremely vigorous gains from Colorado and Oregon. And they're, they're the most mature markets in the country, and they're still seeing massive gains. While on Friday, Florida data revealed that the number of medical patients has surpassed 500K, or 2.35% of the population. When I remember in 2019, they had like 150 thousand patients signed up so cureleaf is a boost and the fact that they were they're retaining all of these patients which means people that go to true leave they do not go back to opioids or prescription they do not go back to where they went before they stick to true leave that is amazing and that is just that's the power of what cannabis is going to be as a medicine going forward so think of that long term um the Florida market's growing. Of course, this link will be below. And again, I want to keep this video short. I know it's gone on a bit longer, um, but new markets are opening up as another growth driver this year as Arizona has already permitted sales. New Jersey will start eventually. Virginia, um, which began sales patients. So I need to learn a bit more about Virginia then. Um, we'll be continuing the rollout of its medical program. But again, so yeah, well, Virginia legalized for adult use, but of course, there's no structure for adult use sales, but it seems like they have begun sales in 2020. So I might need to educate myself a bit more on Virginia's medical side. So my apologies in the past if I've if I've talked kind of crap about it. But um, also thing, we think that one of the biggest drivers is the shift from the illicit market. So again, this just proves if you give legal access to people, they will buy legally so that they can know what they're buying as opposed to going to the black market. You know, you build it, they will come. So growth is coming all around. And so just to end this off, the legal cannabis industry is in its early days with new markets opening and existing ones continuing to ramp up as supply and distribution expands. Even in the most mature markets, there's ample evidence that legal operators are taking share from the illicit market as well. We see that in Canada. We're seeing that in the US and look for the industry to continue to generate strong growth over the balance of 2021. So, you know, again, this the, the data, the facts tell us that this industry is one of the fastest growing in the US. Uh, and we can see that with Cure Leafs numbers and folks, we just have we just have to wait now and be patient as Air Wellness will release their earnings on the 11th. Again, we've got Green Thumb on March 17th, then we've got True Leave on March 23rd, and then we've got Cresco Leave Cresco Labs on March 25th. So lots to look forward to. What did you think about this video, folks? Are you psyched about Cure Leafs earnings? Let me know in the comments. Uh, let me know what you think about them as well and what we can expect from from, from some sorry from some of these other MSOs going forward. I need to slow myself slow myself down from the excitement, but I just want to thank you again. I hope you enjoyed this. Please leave a like on the video if you did. Subscribe if you don't want to miss any new videos, and I will see you on Sunday for This Week in Cannabis. Have a great day, everybody.